Hello, and welcome back to the Wolf's Den. We are the Order of the Green Hand, here to bring some clarity to a song of ice and fire. In parts one and two of our Mysteries, Myths, and Motive series, The Wars to Come, we discussed why we believe that the Kingsguard from the Tower of Joy have continued serving the realm under the guises of Corrin Halfhand, Mance Raider, and Tormund Giantsbane. We also alluded to the fact that these men have not been working alone, but rather with some unlikely allies to prepare for the wars to come. So coming up in this video, we are going to reveal where Mance was prior to Robert's arrival in Winterfell, the identities of some of his unlikely allies and what ties them together, discuss how Melisandre factors in, and who we believe Val the Wildling Princess actually is. As promised, the first thing we're going to get into is where Mance Raider or Arthur Dane was prior to Robert's arrival in Winterfell. For those of you who have not yet watched part two of The Wars to Come, we discussed how the story that Mance tells Jon about how he fell in as a free rider in Robert's royal procession is simply impossible. The trip Mance says he made would have taken him weeks. Ned didn't even find out until the king was only a few days away. That would imply that either Mance was somehow aware of the king's visit before Ned, or Mance was somewhere else, somewhere south of the wall. And not just anywhere south of the wall, but in a location that would allow him to hear about it and still have enough time to get there fast enough to fall in with the King's Royal Party a day south of Winterfell. Which brings us to unlikely ally number one, Wyman Manderley. Wyman Manderley is the Lord of White Harbor, Warden of the White Knife, Shield of the Faith, Defender of the Dispossessed, Lord Marshal of the Mander, and a Knight of the Order of the Green Hand, which some of you may have noticed, just so happens to be the title of our channel. We've dropped some clues here and there about the Order, but today is the day we will begin unraveling the mystery surrounding this ancient Order of Knights. So to begin, we first have to look to the histories of Westeros as we know them. Now, the Manderleys were originally a great house in the Reach, with domains that included the area surrounding the mouth of the Mander River. However, roughly 1,000 years before Aegon's conquest, they were exiled with no reasonable explanation ever offered, and taken in by the Starks, who granted them White Harbor. Because of this, the Manderleys owe the Starks a debt that can, quote, never be repaid. The Manderleys, as well as most of the other great families of the Reach, can trace their ancestry back to Garth Greenhand. Garth was the High King of the First Men. Among the many who claim descendancy from Garth are the Gardeners, Manderleys, Peaks, Bulwars, Redwines, Oakarts, Tarleys, Balls, Rowans, Fossaways, Beesburys, Cranes, Florence, and Hightowers. House Gardiner reigned supreme over the Reach for thousands of years, and those who sat on Garth's oaken seat throne at High Garden came to be called the Gardiner Kings. So clearly, Garth was a busy man, and even managed to spread his seed beyond the Reach and across Westeros, as there were other kings from throughout the realm who were descendants of Garth Greenhand, including the Starks, the Lannisters, and the Durandons. The Durandons were the Storm Kings, and ruled from Storm's End until Aegon's conquest. However, the last Durandon king had a daughter who ended up marrying Aegon the Conqueror's bastard brother, Oris Baratheon, thus making the Baratheons from there on descended from Garth through the female line of House Durandon. This means that four of the seven kingdoms were ruled for thousands of years by kings descended from Garth Greenhand. So, why are we telling you about the descendants of Garth Greenhand and the thought to be extinct order of knights known as the Order of the Greenhand? Well, the same question can be asked of George. 
Why would he introduce an ancient, thought-to-be-extinct order of knights in a dance of dragons if they weren't going to play some sort of role moving forward? So, we actually asked George that very question, and he confirmed that we will in fact learn more about the Order of the Green Hand in future books. At that point, we asked ourselves what role an ancient, thought-to-be-extinct order of knights could play in this story. That got us to thinking about our own histories. Let's take the Templar Knights as an example. The Templar Knights were created to be the defenders of the faith, but it was always rumored that they were the guardians of some secret. Now, according to A World of Ice and Fire, the criteria for membership in the Order of the Green Hand perfectly matches the criteria that the Dane family uses to decide if someone is worthy of being the Sword of the Morning. Additionally, it is also referenced that the first men, many of which were led by the descendants of Garth, were constantly at war with the children of the forest. At this point, we became convinced that the Order of the Green Hand is an ancient order of knights sworn to guard the realms of men and protect the secrets mankind learned when they fought and won the first battle for the dawn thousands of years ago. So let's get back to Mance Raider and his visit to White Harbor prior to Robert's arrival at Winterfell. Well, White Harbor is located very close to Moat Kalen, which means it's extremely likely that whenever someone passes through there, the Manderleys would very quickly be made aware of it. Plus, when you add to that the fact that a king's royal procession draws a lot of attention, it's almost certain that word traveled to White Harbor and quickly. This would mean if Mance was at White Harbor, he would have heard of this in time for him to gather a bag of silver, which the Manderleys have in abundance, and a loot and fall in with Robert's party, roughly a day south of Winterfell, just like he said. While at White Harbor, Mance would have likely stayed in the Wolf's Den, an ancient fortress built by an old king of the north named John Stark. Now the Manderleys claim that the Wolf's Den serves as a prison now, and they keep Davos there after they quote-unquote arrested him. But as it turns out, Davos was never truly a prisoner, and they actually had been keeping him there to hide him from the Freys, as they all thought he had been executed. Davos even makes note of the fact that there are no other prisoners there but him, and that his chambers were queerly comfortable. We believe that the Wolf's Den is not a prison, as they claim it is, but a covert location the Order uses to conduct meetings and hide from the outside world secrets pertinent to their overall mission. Now that we've established where we believe Mance was prior to Robert's arrival, we are now going to discuss where we think he went when he left Winterfell. When John meets Mance, he is accompanied by a group of people, one of which is a pregnant woman named Dalla, who is carrying Mance's child. According to Mance, he met Dalla after he left Winterfell. Now, most, if not all of us, immediately assume that he turned north from Winterfell, since he is, after all, the king beyond the wall. But what if he didn't? Well, there's only one other mention of the name Dalla in the entire A Song of Ice and Fire series. It occurs in the prologue of A Clash of Kings, which we see through the eyes of Maester Cresson, who is in service to Stannis at Dragonstone. Coincidence? I think not. Now, most of us know that Stannis and Melisandre are at Dragonstone at the start of the second novel. We believe that when Mance left Winterfell, he went to Dragonstone, where he met Dalla, just like he told John. As a wise man once said, the best lies contain within them nuggets of truth, enough to give a listener pause. Now, it is estimated that roughly 9 to 11 months go by between the start of Book 2 and the time Stannis attacks the Wildling camp beyond the Wall. This further supports our theory because at the exact time that Stannis is attacking, Dalla is giving birth to Mance's son. Which brings us to unlikely ally number two, Stannis Baratheon. 
Now, some other theorists have put out the whole stannis mance connection, referring to things like the pink letter, and we agree with their assessment. However, we believe that their alliance started long before Stannis defeats Mance and takes him prisoner. While Mance was at Dragonstone, we believe they planned for Mance to quote-unquote attack the Wall, only to have Stannis show up as the King of Westeros with the full power of all seven kingdoms behind him, where Mance would graciously surrender under the terms that his people get to hide behind the Wall and when the time comes, they will fight their common enemy together. Garland Tyrell's ruse with Renly's armor cost Stannis a victory at Blackwater and, in turn, the crown, and threw a wrench in the plan. Stannis then needed to call an audible, changing the plan from a peaceful surrender to an attack on the Wildlings, which would be perceived by the men of the Night's Watch as Stannis answering their pleas for help. Being the only one who came to their aid, Stannis would now wield enough power and authority to force the men of the Night's Watch to allow the wildlings through the wall, which was Mance and Stannis's ultimate goal all along. As both he and Mance knew that if they didn't get the wildlings south of the wall, then it was only a matter of time before they were all killed and turned into whites, adding soldiers to the army of their enemy. I know a lot of you are thinking that this seems pretty crazy. But if you look closely at what actually took place when Stannis attacked the Wildlings, it seems as if he did not really want to kill the Wildlings. Stannis took Mance and the Wildlings completely by surprise, with a couple thousand men on an armored horse formed into two columns which attacked simultaneously from both sides of the camp at once. It should have been a massacre. Yet Stannis says later that only around a thousand wildlings were killed. That is about one percent of the wildlings that Mance brought with him to the Wall. Granted, that number includes men, women, children, and the infirm alike. But either way, that seems pretty bloodless when compared to what might have been expected. He basically inflicted as few casualties as possible and scattered the rest of them. Mance's camp was not exactly a picture of order and discipline, like, for instance, John Kyneton said would be customary for an Arthur Dane-led camp. But just getting all of these groups that absolutely hate one another to march and fight together instead of with one another is a tough enough task in itself. And his lack of preparedness, coupled with his reaction to being attacked, tells me that he wasn't even anticipating a fight. Which is strange, all in itself, if you think about the fact that he had just marched an army up to the wall to attack it, yet he is completely shocked that the other side would hit back. So Stannis has his victory, and Mance is taken captive. At which point, Mance and Stannis talk for quote-unquote hours. So the question then becomes, what would these two have to talk about for quote-unquote hours? Stannis doesn't talk to anyone for hours, let alone Mance Raider, who Stannis describes as being just about as stubborn as a man can be. So, if that was the case, Stannis would have asked him to kneel, Mance would have said no, after a few more back and forths and Stannis asking him about the White Walkers, the conversation would be over. That would not take, quote-unquote, hours. But, if our theory is true, they would have a lot to talk about, since things changed when Stannis did not win the battle at Blackwater and the Crown. Specifically, they needed to figure out how they were going to handle the fate of the King Beyond the Wall under these new circumstances. In the original plan, Mance was going to peacefully surrender, which would give Stannis a justifiable reason to allow him to live. But now, Stannis has no viable reason to publicly allow Mance to live. Thankfully, Melisandre has a few tricks up her sleeve, which makes it possible to publicly execute Mance for desertion and attacking the Wall, which is what people would expect of Stannis, while allowing Mance to live under a glamour which makes him appear to be the Lord of Bones. Now, I doubt it, 
but maybe we're the only ones that thought it was odd that Melisandre ended up with a guy like Stannis. Stannis is a very rigid man who believes in things that are ironclad and definitely does not seem to be the type of man who would stake it all on the words of a sorceress who claims he is the prophesied savior of mankind because she saw it in her fire. So, since it seems unlikely that Stannis would seek out someone such as Melisandre himself, it seems logical that someone else brought her to him. We think it was Mance who brought her to Stannis. Why do we believe this? Well, it all starts with the story Mance tells Jon about why he turned his cloak and abandoned the Night's Watch. One day on arranging, we brought down a fine big elk. We were skinning it when the smell of blood drew a shadow cat out of its lair. I drove it off, but not before it shredded my cloak to ribbons. Do you see? Here, here, and here? He chuckled. It shredded my arm and back as well, and I bled worse than the elk. My brothers feared I might die before they got me back to Maester Mullen at the Shadow Tower so they carried me to a wildling village where we knew an old wise woman did some healing. She was dead as it happened, but her daughter saw to me, cleaned my wounds, sewed me up, and fed me porridge and potions until I was strong enough to ride again. And she sewed up the rents in my cloak as well, with some scarlet silk from a shy that her grandmother had pulled from a wreck of a cog washed up on the frozen shore. It was the greatest treasure she had, and her gift to me. But at the Shadow Tower, I was given a new wool cloak from the stores, black and black, and trimmed with black, to go with my black breeches and black boots, my black doublet and black mail. The new cloak had no frays nor rips nor tears, and most of all, no red. The men of the Night's Watch dressed in black, Sir Dennis Malister reminded me sternly, as if I had forgotten. My old cloak was fit for burning now, he said. I left the next morning, for a place where a kiss is not a crime, and a man could wear any cloak he chose. So, here we have an old wise woman beyond the wall, who Mance and his men sought out to care for his wounds, who happened to have scarlet silk from a shy, and either died and really did have a daughter, or, as we believe, glamoured herself to look like a young woman. Isn't there a character in the books who wears scarlet silks, is associated with a shy, and is suspected to be quite old yet appears much younger? Oh yeah, Melisandre. And to make matters even more complicated, we find it quite likely that Melisandre is really Shiara Seastar, one of Aegon the Unworthy's bastards, who was a half-sister to Bloodraven. It is our belief that she either glamoured herself before Mance and the men arrived, or afterwards using some sort of weird blood spell to make herself appear younger. According to Egg from the Duncan Egg stories, Shiara oft bathed in blood to retain her beauty. There were also rumors that she used sorcery to aid Bloodraven when he served as Hand of the King and Master of Whisperers. Now, when John first meets Melisandre, he thinks to himself that her hair was blood and fire. House Targaryen's words are fire and blood, and so this could be a subtle clue about her Targaryen ancestry. Some other facts supporting this are that both Melisandre and Shiara are described as women with heart-shaped faces, slender waists, and full breasts. Additionally, after explaining to John about how a glamour works, she thinks to herself that the more effortless the sorcery appears, the more men fear the sorcerer, and that that was a lesson she learned long before a shy. This implies that she had been a sorceress long before she became Melisandre. Of a shy. Which begs the question, what was Shiara or Malisandra doing beyond the wall? Well, we believe that she went north of the wall in search of her half-brother and once lover, Bloodraven, who disappeared while ranging in 252. Why do we think that? 
It stems from an answer that George R. R. Martin gave when asked by a fan if Melisandre was sent to Stannis by the priesthood. His response was that she wasn't, and that she has her own agenda. It's pretty obvious that her agenda is to do everything in her power to ensure mankind is ready for the wars to come. And like Bloodraven, she appears to be willing to do whatever it takes, no matter how terrible it is, to win this war. She herself describes this war as a battle for life itself. Taking all that into account, we think it likely that she went beyond the wall to search for Bloodraven, who appears to have devoted his entire life to ensuring that the right people were in the right place at the right time for mankind to be ready when the White Walkers return, and to confirm her own fears that the battle with the Great Other is imminent. Now, we also know that Melisandre religiously burns a night fire from dusk till dawn for the night is dark and full of terrors. Now we know that she easily converted the Florence to the faith of R'hllor, who, if you remember, are one of Garth Greenhand's descendants, wink wink, and eventually even Stannis. As evidenced in various passages throughout the books, Stannis understands who the true enemy is and that the real war will be between mankind and, as Stannis himself said, the ancient enemy, the only enemy that matters. We've alluded to the fact that Corrin and Mance also appear to be aware of this. Furthermore, it seems a real possibility that Mance is a man who also puts some faith in the Lord of Light. This is evident in a passage from A Game of Thrones, where Mormont tells John what he's heard from some of the rangers about Mance Raider. Rangers from the Shadow Tower have found whole villages abandoned, and at night, Sir Dennis says they see fires in the mountains, huge blazes that burn from dusk till dawn. From this, we can see that Mance is burning night fires from dusk till dawn, just like Mel, which lends credence to the idea that she is the woman who cared for him after he was attacked by the Shadow Cat. Now, I know some of you are probably wondering if we think Stannis really believed he was Azor Ahai, and if Melisandre did as well. Well, no, we don't think that Stannis truly bought into the Mummers show, but we do think that he felt duty-bound as the true king of Westeros to do everything he could to fight in the battle for life itself. In terms of what Mel believes, it seems that she did, at the very least at first, think that Stannis was the one from prophecy. And honestly, who can blame her? Stannis is a just man, who is honorable, dutiful, trustworthy, and happens to be a brilliant battle commander. Or maybe she just wanted to believe she found Azor Ahai so badly that she allowed herself to be misled. As always, Maester Aemon says it best. Lady Melisandre has misread the signs. Stannis. Stannis has some of the dragon blood in him, yes. His brothers did as well. Rael, Egg's little girl. She is how they came by it. Their father's mother. She used to call me Uncle Maester when she was a little girl. I remembered that, so I allowed myself to hope. Perhaps I wanted to. We all deceive ourselves when we want to believe. Melisandre most of all, I think. The sword is wrong. She has to know that. Light without heat, an empty glamour. The sword is wrong, and the false light can only lead us deeper into darkness, Sam. So we spent a good portion of this video establishing possible connections on the eastern side of Westeros that would allow these men to coordinate their efforts to ensure mankind was ready for the wars to come. But the connections in the west and those with men from across the narrow sea will have to wait until our next video. And I know we keep promising to reveal the identity of Val, but unfortunately that's going to have to wait until next time too. But before we go, we'd like to end by leaving you with a clue, which is provided in A Feast for Crows. A clue that we believe is the key to understanding how the various subplots will eventually intertwine and what connects many of the key characters that we have all come to know and love. After Tyrion's escape, 
The Lannisters begin searching the Black Cells in an attempt to figure out how he managed to get out. Their search leads them to Rugen, an undergaler who we all know is actually Varys. When they search his cell, they found something hidden beneath his chamber pot. It was a coin. A coin that Kyburn tells Cersei dates back before the conquest. A coin incised with the face of a gardener king on one side, and a green hand on the other. <laughs> 